So solubility equilibrium. Um, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Uh, talk about something other than acids and bases for a little while. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I think this is fairly easy. It's not all that complicated. Um, and you don't need to write all this down. These are Again, these are old notes. They've got everything that you need on there, but probably more than you need. Um, so just a reminder on a precipitation reaction. That's where you've got your ions combining. They form a solid. They fall to the bottom of a solution. Okay. Um, and I guess I decided we need some examples of that. Kidney stones and stalactite stalagmites. Um, Anyway, moving on. Dissolution reaction uh, is the opposite of a precipitation. So you've got a solid dissolving. Okay. Well, turns out when you've got a solubility equilibrium, you've got both of those happening at the same time. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Right? They're going. I don't know. I should have said it just two times. Sorry, I said surprise three times, and that was too much. I apologize for that. Um, I, yeah, I just I went way too far. Um, but a solubility equilibrium. <laughs> That's what happens, right? Little people say things more more times. They talk, they talk faster. Their hearts beat faster. All of that stuff, you know. Um, all right. Anyway, sorry. So, um, <laughs> exactly. So solubility equilibrium. Um, Again, they're both happening at the same time. You're getting a precipitation and a dissolution. Um, that's why it's an equilibrium. And this is going to happen in saturated solutions. All right? Saturated solutions, uh, usually you've got something sitting at the bottom. And it's not, again, it's like any equilibrium reaction. It's not really going to look like anything is happening once it reaches equilibrium. But what's really happening here is that you've got some of this solid at any given moment that is uh, dissolving, right? And then at the same moment, you've got some of the dissolved um, solid that is now re-precipitating, all right? So both of these things are happening at once. And that's a saturated solution of BaSO4. So what we're talking about for basically the rest of this section, we're talking about um, solubility in terms of saturated solutions, okay? Uh, I didn't leave myself any room here. But basically, we just need to do practice problems for these because there's not a lot of conceptual stuff to talk about that you haven't already learned. Um, so you've got a saturated solution of potassium nitrate. you got 100 grams of KNO3 to 100 grams of water. Okay, now, KNO3 is very soluble, right? Because it's an alkali metal. It's potassium and nitrate. And you remember earlier in the year, we learned that both of those things dissolve always, right? Unless you add 100 grams of it into 100 grams of water, right? That's too much. So at that point, uh, not all of it can dissolve in the water, and some of it's just going to sink to the bottom, okay? Um, I'm having trouble concentrating. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so then we dilute it with 100 grams of water, additional 100 grams of water, and there's still some KNO3 remaining at the bottom of the solution, okay? Uh, this is a weird question. I thought that we were going to jump into the calculations, but this is conceptual. How does the concentration of K plus in the initial solution compare to the concentration of K plus? Okay, this is probably something we should talk about. They like to throw this on the AP exam every once in a while. Um, so I've got this 100 grams solution, or 100 grams of KNO3 and 100 grams of water, okay? Obviously, there's some solid at the bottom of that, right? Then I add 100 more grams of water, there's still some solid at the bottom. So how does the concentration of the KNO3 compare um, for both of those solutions? Which one's going to have a higher concentration of KNO3? Or are they the same? No, concentration, I'm talking about the stuff that's dissolved in the solution, right? Say it again. The diluted one will have a higher concentration of ions? Okay. It will have a higher amount of ions, but it will not have a higher concentration of ions, right? Because remember, your concentration is your amount, your number of moles, divided by the volume, right? So basically, all that happens when we add the water, more of the KNO3 dissolves, 
but we also have a higher volume, right? So the concentration actually doesn't change. So guess what, uh, guess what we have to do to change the concentration of a saturated solution? Yeah, change the temperature, right? That's the main thing that will change the solubility. So, yeah, kind of a tricky question. They like to put that on the AP exam every once in a while, a question like that. Um, as long as you still have some solid at the bottom, the concentration of the KNO3 that's dissolved in the, the solution is going to stay the same. Now, what if I add enough water that now there is no KNO3 on the bottom anymore? Then what can I say about the concentration of the KNO3? Actually, at, the, at that point, it would be less, right? Because I've, I've diluted it enough now that all that KNO3 has dissolved. And if I keep adding water, then I'm just going to keep diluting it, and the concentration is going to get lower. Does that make sense? Right. It won't go higher at that temperature. Yeah. But you, if you keep adding water, you can get the concentration to go lower. Yeah, and that's why we call it saturated, right? Because at that temperature, that is the maximum amount of solid that the water can hold, right? You can't get any more in there than that. Okay. Um, equilibrium constant for the BASO4 solubility equilibrium indicates how soluble... Uh, that sentence doesn't make sense. Sorry. Basically, the equilibrium constant for anything will show you approximately how soluble that compound is in water, okay? So if you have a large equilibrium constant, it's going to be very soluble. Small equilibrium constant means it's not very soluble. And the reason for that is because there's a standard way to write these solubility uh, equilibrium reactions, and here's how we usually write them. So like for BASO4, you'll put the solid on the left side, that's an equilibrium with the ions, the dissolved ions on the right side. Okay? That's the typical way that you write a solubility equilibrium. So at any given moment, you know, some of this solid is breaking apart into ions, and then some of these ions are coming back together to form the solid. And since we write it that way, a large equilibrium constant means uh, which direction is favored. That means the right side is favored, the product side, right? So large equilibrium constant means very soluble. In other words, you're going to have a lot of the ions. You have a small equilibrium constant, then it's going to tend to be more on the reactant side. Okay, so a lot more of the solid, not very soluble. The letters for K. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's why for solubility, this is another important one, right? We have, we've had KW, KA, and KB so far. Now we have KSP. And that stands for solubility product. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now if we're writing an equilibrium constant expression for this, because I just wrote the equation over here, uh, remember you leave out your solids and your equilib equilibrium expressions, right? So how would we write this equilibrium expression? K equals, using the BASO4 example. BA2 plus times SO4 2 minus. And that's it. Uh, the nice thing about these solubility equations is there's usually no denominator. Right, because the only thing you usually have on the left side of the equation is a solid, and that doesn't go in our equilibrium expression. Um, so if the KSP for BASO4 is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 10th, guess what we can figure out pretty easily here? Well, okay, yeah, that definitely means it's not very soluble. You know, in fact, I think that's kind of what I meant there, now that you say that. I, I think... I'm jumping ahead of myself here a little bit, but you can actually use that solubility constant most of the time to figure out what concentrations of each of the ions you're going to have in there also, right? Because all we have to do is just call this, if this is X, then so is this, if you're setting up an ice table, right? So you basically just take the square root of the KSP, as long as it's just a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, and that will give you your concentration of your ions, okay? 
Now you got to watch that because it's not always one-to-one -one stoichiometry anymore. We've left acids and bases where it's always one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Uh, and here you can have some things that are not. So you have to kind of watch that. All right, but what, what I think I was getting at here, if the KSP for BASO4 is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 10th, that means what? Yeah, this is not very soluble. Okay, so BASO4 is one of those things that does not dissolve very well in water. Um, you'll have a few ions running around in there, but, you know, you take the square root of 1 times 10 to the negative 10th, and, you know, that's going to be not very many. <laughs> 1 times 10 to the negative 5th, right? So that's a small number of ions. Am I right in, on that? Let me, make, let me check my math. I'm doubting my math. Square root of 1 times 10 to the negative 10th. Oh, yeah, I was right. Okay, that doesn't happen very often when I'm doing mental math. Uh, the expression for the solubility constant for CaF2. Okay, so now we've got a, uh, a couple of these here. So CaF2, um, what's the equilibrium expression for that one? Okay, and here's where you have to be a little careful, right? CaF2 solid. I would I would write the equations for these just to make sure, right? Ca2 plus plus F minus. But I've got to put a two here to balance the equation, right? So then it would be Ca2 plus. Yeah, and again, uh, F minus squared, right? Now if I was doing x's for this one. This is where you'd also have to be careful. Let's say that I make an ice table for this to, to figure out my, um, my concentrations based on my KSP. Um, we're going to start with zero of both of these, right, if you just put the CAF2 in water to begin with. Um, this is going to change by plus x, but this one's going to change by plus 2x, right? So if I plug that in, then this ends up being k is equal to x times 2x squared, okay? Does that make sense? Because this is going to be the equilibrium concentration here is going to be x. The equilibrium concentration here is 2x. And when I plug it into this, I have to square that 2x value. k equals 4x cubed on that one, all right? So that's where you have to be careful. People are just weird on Fridays sometimes. All right, so um, there's the CAF2, and I've got barium carbonate. Okay, so you can kind of think about how you'd write the expression for that one, and then silver sulfate. Um, out of those three, which is the most soluble in water? Trying to trick you. No, silver is an ion. No, I'm not trying to trick you in that way. Well, I mean, not that much. You know, it's still 1.5 times 10 to the negative fifth. Why can I not look at these KSPs and compare them to one another just by looking at the KSP? Because when I ask which is the most soluble in water, what am I really wanting to know there? Am I wanting to know the K value? What do I measure to figure out the solubility? Concentration of the ions in that solution, right? Okay. So you're going to have to solve for X on all of these to figure out which one is the most soluble in water, okay? so. The reason I'm asking this question is just to show you, be careful. You can't just look at the KSP and figure out which one is the most soluble. You have to solve for x, all right? Because that's going to tell you how many Ca2 plus ions and how many F minus ions you have in the solution. And that will give you an idea of your solubility, all right? Um, usually solubility, when, when they ask for solubility, what they're actually asking you for, and this you need to remember, this is important. 
When they ask you for solubility, what they're asking you for is the value for X. They are not asking about the KST, okay? So the equilibrium constant is different than the solubility. They're related to one another, but they're not exactly the same because the stoichiometry is not always one-to-one, -one. okay? You guys following? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go ahead and figure out all these x's right now because we've got some other example problems that we can use to, to go through that. I just wanted to make that point on here that you can't just compare the KSPs and know for sure. Um, now, when could I compare KSPs? when they have the exact same stoichiometry. So let's say I was comparing uh, barium carbonate and um, barium sulfate, right? Both one-to-one -one stoichiometry, so I just take the square root of both of those KSPs, and that's going to tell me. So I could actually look at those two values, and I could compare them, all right? But if it's not the same stoichiometry, you can't compare. So just to be safe, I would... I would always solve for x before you answer that solubility question, okay? And this is what I just said. Got ahead of myself a little bit. <clears throat> solubility is how much of that substance will dissolve. So in other words, the concentration of the ions is going to tell you the solubility. KST is just the equilibrium constant, all right? And that will give you an idea of how soluble something is, but it, it just gives you a rough idea. Um, solubility depends on several things. You can change the solubility by changing the concentration of other things that are in there. Uh, you can change the pH of the solution. That can change the solubility. The only way you're going to change that K value is temperature. temperature. That's the only way you can ever change K, right? So as long as it's at a constant temperature, K is always constant, but otherwise you can change the K by changing the temperature. All right, so those are some differences between solubility and KFP. Um, yeah, great care must be taken when trying to calculate one from the other. On your reading guide, I actually tell you to read through uh, the section at the very end of the solubility section, um, and it basically talks about this issue. Why can't you compare KSP to solubility exact why isn't it exactly a one to one correlation there? All right. Uh, solubility curves. I think we've dealt with these before, haven't we? Didn't we talk about solubility curves last year? Actually maybe we didn't get that far last year. Uh, but it's basically a graph that, that shows you um, the solubility of a certain chemical at different temperatures. And it will show you how much will dissolve at at those temperatures, okay? Does this look familiar? Yeah. Okay, so we have talked about this. So most things, when you increase the solubility, or increase the temperature, sorry, you're going to increase the solubility, right? Most things. Now, there are some things that are an exception to that. NH3 is a notable exception. The, um, well, why is NH3 an exception to that? What is NH3, typically? Well, okay, it is a base, but what is just pure NH3? What state of matter does it usually exist in? It's, did you know that? It's usually a gas. Okay, if it's not dissolved in water, it's usually a gas. Okay. Um, thank you. So, gas is dissolved in water. Do you remember what happens when you increase the temperature of a gas? or increase the temperature of a solution where there's a gas dissolved in it? Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're on the right track. So you leave a two liter out in the sun, right? Then you open it, it explodes. All that gas was trying to get out of there, right? So as soon as you release the pressure, it will leave because it's warmer. That's why you keep your soda in the fridge just because gas dissolves better in cold water than it does in warm water. We talked about this earlier in the year, I'm pretty sure, in relation to fish, right? 
fish like cold streams better because there's more oxygen in them. Except they probably don't like, you know. But they, they, they have more oxygen in the cold stream. Cold streams can actually support more aquatic life. I should say that, OK? <laughs> um, all right, so anyway, point is, uh, the rest of these things are solids that are being dissolved in water. And for the most part, when you increase the temperature of uh, water, then you can dissolve more of the solid. Now, sodium chloride doesn't make a lot of a difference. And then cesium sulfate, for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, is kind of an exception to that, where it actually uh, solubility decreases as you increase the temperature. But pretty much everything else on this list is going to go up. Um, so which compound is the greatest solubility at 70 degrees? And that's just a, that's an ACT science question right there. Read the graph and interpret it, right? Excluding Ki because you don't know where Ki is at, at 70 degrees. But which one has the greatest solubility at 70? Can you see it from there? It's just barely in ANO3, okay? You go up any higher than that, and it's probably going to be the KNO3. But the NaNO3 actually, 70 is right here. OK, so the NaNO3 is going to just barely have a higher solubility. And then the greatest percentage of which compound could be recovered by cooling the water from 70 to 50? So you cool it from 70 to 50, which one is going to re-precipitate the most? Uh, no, actually, in H3, you cool it from 70 to 50, you're going to increase the solubility, right? You're, yeah, you want to decrease the solubility because you're going to recover the solid, right? Oh. Yeah, so it would be the KNO3 because this has the steepest slope, right? Okay. All right, practice problem. Solid silver chromate is added to pure water. Some of the solid remains undissolved at the bottom of the flask. Translation, what kind of solution? Saturated, right? Saturated solution, so we're doing equilibrium here. Mixtures stirred for several days. <laughs> that's, that's commitment right there. Okay. Uh, to ensure that equilibrium is achieved, uh, analysis of the equilibrated solution shows that the silver ion, its silver ion concentration is 1.3 times to the negative fourth. Assuming that it dissociates completely in water and there are no other important equilibria involving the Ag plus or Cr 42 minus ions, which is a, kind of a bad assumption, but <coughs> assuming that, calculate the KSP for this compound. Hmm. Any ideas? Okay, we probably want to make an ice table. I mean, for, for most equilibrium, that is the answer, right? Make an ice table. Um, I don't have a lot of room to write this. Yeah, that's a good idea. I don't know if you're going to be able to see the red over the black or not. Um, well, the red seems most likely. Um, OK, so Ag2CrO4 is the solid. And if I'm going to write my equilibrium equation here, and that's going to dissociate into 2 Ag plus plus CrO4 2 minus. All right, so there's my equation. If I make my ice table, I should plan ahead and make a blank screen. But um, yeah, I kind of need to see the numbers. Um, so we know at equilibrium, the silver ion concentration is 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth. Well, in this scenario, what was it initially? At the beginning, yeah, solid silver chromate is added to pure water. So at the beginning, that's right, divided by two. that would be zero, right? Because at the very beginning of this thing, we've just added the solid, assuming that it hasn't you know, dissociated yet at that point. And then it begins to dissociate, right? So then this is going to go up by 2x. This is going to go up by x. We don't care about this, because it's not going to go in our equilibrium expression. Um, so then we end up with 2x and x down here, okay? Uh, no, you got to, um, oh, to get the concentration, yes, yes, because what we're given here, actually, I'm doing this in x's and I shouldn't be, sorry. That's my fault. We started with zero, 
they tell us that at equilibrium it's 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth, right? So then you're right, you divide that by 2, um, which is, <laughs> thank you, 6.5. I sh really should be able to do that in my head. And 10 to the negative uh, fifth. And then, so then that tells us what these change by, but Sorry. Thank you. I guess technically what I should have done here is plus 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth, and then this would change by plus 6.5 times 10 to the negative fifth, because the change column is the one you're supposed to pay attention to the stoichiometry, and then you just add those together, and then you get your two values. Then we can calculate the KSP for this thing, okay? Now you got to think about what the KSP expression is for this one. It's going to be uh, the AG plus squared, right? For my AG plus value, I have to square it. 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth squared times 6.5 times 10 to the negative fifth. And that would give you your K. Yeah, it's really, it's the same as any equilibrium problem. It's just specifically for solubility instead. And there are kind of some special things you can do with these because there is no denominator in any of these problems. So they can, they can actually give you a lot less information with a solubility problem, and you can still solve it. Um, and you don't have to ever worry about uh, quadratic formulas or anything like that with solubility, which I think is kind of nice. You don't have to worry about simplifying assumptions, any of that stuff. Okay? Let's see if there's any other problems we need to talk about here. Okay, so this one, they're giving us the KSP. And then we want to know the solubility of CAF2. Now, do you remember what I said? Um, ooh, grams per liter. Oh, yeah, we can do that. OK, yeah. Sorry. So the uh, solubility needs to be in grams per liter. That's often the way that it's calculated. Well, when we, when we solve for x, remember, solubility is really asking us for x here. OK? Um, we're going to get moles per liter, right? That's our concentration. So then at the end, we'll just have to change moles per liter into grams per liter. But we can do that just using the molar mass of CAF2. OK? So first thing I would do again here is just write the equation. I'll do this quickly, because we've got to get, we got to be done. Um, Minus. Um, so then again, we're assuming that we start with zero. This time we don't know the numbers, so it's going to be plus x plus 2x. All right. So then I know my KST is 3.9 times 10 to the ne negative 11. That's going to be equal to x times 2x squared, which is always going to end up being 4x cubed, right? So then you just solve for x on that one. And then I always just take it to the 1 3rd power. Um, so then our x value that we solve for here is 2.1. Let me do my fig figs right here. dissolve in a liter of solution, okay? So when I solve for x here, I'm really solving for the calcium concentration, right? That's not the fluoride concentration. It's the calcium concentration. But the calcium is in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry with the CAF2. So that's why I would want to use my x value, okay? Because that's going to tell me also how, much, how many moles, essentially, um, of my CAF2 I have as well, okay? Assuming a one liter solution, which we can do here. Um, so 2.1 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter, right? 
And then basically all I have to do from there is change that to grams per liter. So I have to figure out you know, how many grams of CAF2 are in a mole. Using my molar mass there. And that will give me that solubility in grams per liter. Okay. And it is 3 o'clock, so I probably need to be done. Let me make sure there's not anything else here. Uh, yeah, basically the same thing, except this time they're having you... Oh, okay. Talking about pH. Um, so the only thing that's different on this one, really it's, it's very similar to this one, where they're giving me a, an equilibrium concentration, right? But they're doing it in kind of a sneaky way, because... What are they giving me the equilibrium concentration of when they give me the pH? Right, indirectly they're giving me the well, they're giving me the concentration of the H plus, which I can use to find the concentration of the OH minus, right? So then at that point it becomes essentially just like this problem, okay, where you're calculating for the KSP. So I don't think there's yeah, that's it. So I mean that's that's basically solubility equilibrium. It's not all that complicated. Um, there's a couple of things they add to it at the end, but I think you might end up liking this a little bit better than the uh, acid-based stuff. All right, so we'll see you guys whenever we see you, I guess, Monday or Tuesday.